panel is on the outliers of lifestyle and reality television. And we've got three speakers um, who I'll introduce briefly one after the other. Um, we will have um, one paper after the other with all the questions at the end. And what we'll do is basically um, each paper has 20 minutes and I will shout a short two minutes at 18 minutes so that people know they should start wrapping up soon. So without further ado, let me introduce people. So the first speaker is Abigail Jenkins from the University of Glasgow. Now, I hope that this guest is a guest and not something else. That looks good so far. Um, she's just updated her bio, so let me read that out. Um, Abigail Jenkins is a lecturer in film and media at the University of Glasgow. Their research dissects representation of fat bodies in contemporary British and American television, looking in particular at intersections between fatness and various feminisms and combining activist with scholarly approaches. And today's paper is on the cruelty of wellness interrogating fat bodies in lifestyle reboots. Um, over to you, Abigail. Thanks very much. Let me just get my screen shared here. All right. Um, I apologize all if you can hear the seagulls at any point outside my window. Um, OK, hello, everyone. Uh, just making sure my windows are all organized here so I get started. Um, so uh, thank you very much Alka, for that introduction. Yes, this paper is The Cruelty of Wellness. Um, I, in looking at the call for papers uh, for this conference, I started thinking about what those outliers were. Um, lifestyle programs in reality television have long been very rightfully criticized for the ways in which they provide instructions that uphold neoliberal norms, often those thin centric, heteronormative, middle class, white coated values um, through tough love, ridicule and shame. So, yeah, in thinking about outliers of television, I wondered about the newest crop of these lifestyle programs. So I thought, what might we say about American wellness television. Uh, it's the seeming sort of antidote, this holistic, soft colored, good vibes approach to ushering folks both on screen and off through lifestyle changes. So I'll be thinking about this a little bit today by considering uh, two shows, the weight loss competition show, Biggest Loser, um, the reboot of which is on the USA Network and the queer centric lifestyle show, Queer Eye on Netflix. Um, but these thoughts could be applied to a number of programs as we see further lifestyle programs become rebooted. So we might think about um, programs like What Not to Wear, which recently rebooted, or The Real World. Um, these shows that are, are sort of taking on a new edge um, or lack of edge, I suppose, in their reboots. I'm definitely not the very first person to note this about a shift toward wellness rhetoric. It's pretty hard to avoid. Uh, wellness rhetoric in our day and age, particularly over the last five years with the changing tones and a kind of uh, a new hyper focus on the lifestyle imagery of, say, apps like Instagram and TikTok. But I do think there's something particularly enlightening about this shift that we can find in investigating fatness more specifically. Uh, so I'd like to start by considering Lauren Berlant's notion of cruel optimism. Um, sort th I find this is sort of interrelated with the more popular conception of toxic positivity, but I'm a lot more interested in, in how Berlant uses this. Uh, they define or use the term to define that almost ineffable human experience in which something you deeply desire is also detrimental in some manner to your well-being. Um, however, this isn't just, you know, that extra piece of cake that will keep you up all night because of sugar or whatever. Um, Berlant thinks about cruel optimism as a condition fostered specifically in neoliberal um, societies. So they map it from the 1980s um, and show how it's become intricately woven into this fantasy of the good life. Um, and in the case of the US, the American dream. Berlant unpacks the ways in which this condition relates to this wider cultural fixation on fantasy and on freedom. 
um, but also at how it appears to increase or take on more fervor in the midst of precarity and crisis. I'd like us to keep this notion in mind as we consider the decisions and values at the very heart of the shift toward positivity, toward wellness, that permeates shows like Biggest Loser and Queer Eye. Uh, these shows have been recently rebooted and rebranded to reflect some ethos or supposed ethos of self-love and care. They're congratulated for their willingness to assign a degree of humanity to participants. Uh, so you'll see between these two slides the significant difference between, and <laughs> they're flipped around here, but this this bottom picture being the original series in which they look a lot more critical and they're kind of making fun of their contestant and the the top being the rebooted series in which we're sort of presented to who are often called in um in in popular criticism of the show heroes our queer eye heroes um and and a similar change in aesthetics here too so the biggest loser original series on the top there host jillian michaels is pointing and screaming at someone um, and it's kind of like dark, washed out uh, image. And then underneath that, you see from the rebooted series, uh, host Erica Lugo is, has got her arms around these folks as they sort of cry and, and connect together. Um, so these shifts in tone from obliquely cruel to sort of gently optimistic are marked as important in a lot of discourse about these programs. Not all discourse. Um, but certainly uh, put forward by their networks as as powerful changes to older forms. Um, this tone this tone is further heightened and complicated when we apply it to fat bodies, I think, although we do see it in across reality television. Um, the larger forms of fat bodies sort of push these boundaries between optimism and cruelty into a starker relief. Uh, and and help us to see that cheery optimism that these wellness reboots are steeped in that's kind of detached from reality um, and sort of belies their continued problematic ties with this, you know, neoliberal ideal of an optimal self. These shows and their counterparts promise to grapple with concepts that earlier renditions addressed in ways that we just consider outmoded, in short. Um, however, in reality, lifestyle reboots like these have more aptly been able to evade criticism by strategically employing claims of positive representation rather than by actually restructuring an approach to offer, I don't know, for example, restorative justice for the Biggest Loser contestants who are mistreated by a famously cruel physical trainer, Jillian Michaels, pictured on the top there. Michael's approach, reflective of the approach taken by the original show for 17 seasons, uh, Biggest Loser ran for 17 seasons, can neatly be summed up by one of her trademark voiceovers. What do you do? She asks in an early episode of season nine, referring to the team of fat contestants fighting to keep running on a row of treadmills. You do the same thing you do every other week, she says. You beat the hell out of them. And yet, for as transparently callous and completely dehumanizing this language is, the current state of the Biggest Loser reboot may be even more damaging. The show was once content with simply forcing a group of fat people to vie for life-changing sums of money by enduring grueling physical challenges on a national stage. Now it wants to keep this core pursuit. They are still in competition with each other. You still have two teams of fat people competing against one another to lose weight. Um, so this this remains in the reboot, but it also embodies suddenly something praiseworthy, popular, positive. So masquerading as holistic and caring, the wellness version of the show relies on the insights of seemingly kinder personal trainers than Jillian Michaels. Replacing Michael's uh, breathless orders to faint, puke, or die, but just keep walking. Uh, we have Erica Lugo, a physical trainer and also a formerly fat woman, uh, who seems to continually always be smiling. You can kind of see her down in the bottom picture there. Um, she handles her contestants with more tact. So in, in one scene from the first rebooted season, she beams at this man here, uh, a large gray-haired man sweating on a treadmill called Jim Bat D. Batista. Uh, 
the camera, which aims at her irrepressible grin, catches only the width of Jim's shoulder and the side of his face as he wipes away tears with the back of his hand. His energy is fading, but he has to keep running. She urges him on with platitudes, saying, you are allowed to be a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. And she pushes the holistic approach of the show. The way she sees it is it is a competition to lose weight, but also a competition to change your life. So this man, Jim DiBattista, went on to lose 144 pounds by the end of the season, the rebooted season, and he won the show's grand prize of $100,000. In interviews following the competition, you see, uh, as in this quote here, he happily echoes that deeply in logic of the show. And across the interviews and the press around the show, despite this sort of pretense of wellness, um, we see D. Batista in before and after photos like this, showing still, regardless of the kind eye that we take to it, his fat body is problematic and bad. Despite the show's purported committed to cha- commitment to change then, the actual visual and narrative style of the show remains outside of the kinder language, largely unchanged from the original series. Contestants are still portrayed through handheld cameras that sway and zoom in on body parts or show the inelegance of their motions, running on a treadmill, dragging enormous tires. Later episodes in the first rebooted series do see blurry and dark videos of the fatter contestants trying activities for the very first time. Um, And then they position those against their new, improved, thinner self performing the same activities, uh, but this time with ease. Uh, a similar though more muted progression in tone happens between the original Queer Eye and the 2018 reboot pictured here of the same name Um, originally named Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and shortened after the first series Queer Eye is a makeover show that's very popular many of us have probably watched it um, which stars five gay men called the Fab Five who are intent on quickly training a person, a contestant, to see themselves with this sort of uh, same critical eye that these men can provide because of their um, their status or their position. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the original Fab Five anyhow. Uh, although not as cruel as Jillian Michaels, the original Fab Five would take digs at their participant for usually a straight man for his interior decorating, calling the room stupid or ridiculous or a boring man cave. Um, they'd criticize his fashion, saying things like, put some shoes on, you look like a hillbilly, um, and, uh, and his lifestyle as well. So saying, jokingly saying things like, we're here to help you develop really expensive habits. Um, so the reboot does do away with these digs in favor of kind of softer teasing, glancing, joking looks, and then a more powerful emphasis on individual effort. So if the original Fab Five were critical of their participants' tastes in fashion, decor, and hobbies, this more recent group cloaks that criticism in in sweet but pithy one-liners and euphemisms. Think about lifestyle Karamo Brown, pictured here second from the left. Um, Karamo tells one participant in a soothing tone of voice, being an adult means being a person of action. When you make your plan and go after that plan, you will succeed. Um, So this, I found this phrase particularly interesting because although it sounds positive and is about success, there is that more sinister critique hiding underneath. That is that expectation of, you know, performing normativity and performing wealth on and within the body. Um, And it's all tied up with these notions of adulthood and what it means to be an adult. Uh, The niceties and the potential for wealth and fame position the show is important, ultimately, and its paternal tone becomes kind of patronizing in such a way that it further upholds wellness as a way of seeing ability and size through a patriarchal and capitalist lens. Um, So we do see this particularly in episodes with fat folks, um, where the dialogue becomes a little less comfortable with being critical Uh, but we still have to work around the fat or find some way to accommodate it. Um, And and that can just, it can be a bit tricky. Aesthetics here 
still are the recourse to this sort of semblance of of I guess what we might call proper bio citizenship, um, you know, of of enacting these neoliberal norms on and in the body. Um, of course, individual improvements, um, you know, are are a, a wider focus of reality television. But in the case of the Queer Eye reboot, um, these are ostensibly done with love and care. Um, so there's resounding praise, especially online, for the way that these wellness-minded shows affect caring change. There are, of course, detractors, and we have seen a lot more recently of folks highlighting things like toxic positivity or the problematic nature in putting a sheen on an older show. Um, yet still, overall, the shifts in tone from that obliquely cruel to this sort of sense of gentle optimism. These are marked as important as changes with a great deal of meaning for oppressed groups in particular who haven't had the drive to progress without coaching and insistence. At least that's the idea. Um, reality television has been and continues to be, as I mentioned, scrutinized for its connection to the neoliberal idea of self-help and as a poor replacement for government programs and welfare. And yet there's something different happening in these more recent iterations for although the optimistic tone of these reboots is blatantly different than their turn of the century predecessors a change in effect toward participants well-being is unproven these programs are still populated by experts at wellness whose lives are optimized who have supposedly earned the right to counsel failed subjects toward better ways of living Biggest Loser is still a show about publicly losing weight for a cash reward and a large cash reward. Queer Eye is still a show aimed at making people into better consumers um, and better participants in capitalism. And both shows benefit from their connections to wellness and positivity. These intersections are complex because they do appear to, on the surface, demarcate clear social progress of some form. Um, however, in taking for granted the importance of the aesthetically pleasing image, whether made thin or made over, these wellness reboots seem to embody yet another death knell to the faraway promise of public welfare. That is, resistance to the plastered on smiles of coach Erica Lugo or Karamo Brown's gentle nodding would provide more than just evidence of a poorly constructed neoliberal biocitizen. Resistance to positivity would signal a refusal to accept imagined futures in favor of lived realities. That kind of refusal comes at a literal cost. Winning Biggest Loser, even securing the post-elimination crowd favorite prize of $25,000, means being rewarded with a life-changing amount of money. Being featured on Queer Eye means accumulating a new wardrobe, a newly furbished home, a subscription to a new hobby, and potentially a whole new network of friends. Both open up avenues to monetizing the self by capitalizing on public appearance. Winners of Biggest Loser, for example, have gone on to mobilize their brief fame by motivational speaking, athleisure sales, marketing for fitness routine empires like SoulCycle and CrossFit. Um, and two Queer Eye contestants whose restaurant was made over have turned their barbecue sauce sales into a major business, um, even appearing on Steve Harvey's talk show, Steve, to sell their handmade sauces. So the shift to positivity is met with a popular obsession in mapping the lasting effects of these programs on people's lives, so as to reassert their worth as legitimate rather than, I guess, trashy in the public eye. The illusion of the power of individual effort is, it is powerful for a lucky few privileged enough to demonstrate aesthetic and representative potential in the face of monetary need, particularly those willing to perform as fulfilled by lightness and satisfied by apologetic positivity. Further, the representation of fat bodies in these wellness-driven spaces is specifically taken for granted as necessary in the US, a country where even the most basic of healthcare provisions are reserved for wealthy, those wealthy, thin, and able enough to deserve them. Fat people are not only routinely turned away from receiving appropriate medical care, they are also demonized in public health campaigns and blamed for a range of perceived societal ills. In the U.S., they have long shouldered the blame for a failing medical infrastructure, and in the U.K. as well. Obesity 
in quotes, has been bluntly framed as an epidemic for more than three decades, despite a growing body of research demonstrating that this is not the case. Two minutes. Health researchers continue to consider fatness a disease of mind and body even throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, arguing under the guise of care for fat patients that the U.S. is experiencing a dual pandemic threat. Added to the consistent messaging on long-running television shows in which fat people are routinely abused, the biggest loser, uh, ridiculed, like on My Big Fat Fabulous Life, and made spectacle, like on shows with names like My 600 Pound Life, the embracing of a sensibility of wellness denotes a practical desire to shift biases about obesity through more mundane and inoffensive imagery of fat people as normal, sexual, and able-bodied. However, it is not enough to be optimistic, to take for granted the heaping measures of smiling encouragement and ignore realities. We've started talking in public spheres about toxic positivity, and I do think these concepts go hand in hand. What is improvement anyway, when situated in the murky waters of cruel optimism? When the very thing that is meant to help, that encouraging word, that weight loss advice, that community created by a series of experts, serves only to further entrench the painful realities of fatness under capitalism. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, really good. And you kept to, to time, which is brilliant. Um, for some reason, my camera is not coming on. There we go. Um, our next speaker is Alkim Kutlu, who will talk to us about um, a seat at the table, food television and the changing definition of food literacy and culinary capital. Um, she's a lecturer and doctoral candidate at the, Univers uh, at the Institute for Media and Cultural Studies at Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. Her dissertation focused on the history, aesthetic and cultural politics of food and travel series produced in the US. She holds an MA in the field of English and Transcultural Studies from Ruprecht Karls University in Heidelberg and a BA in English from Bogazici oh, University in Istanbul. She was previously a lecturer at Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg before starting her position at um, Heinrich Heine University. Her research interests include food, media, gender and queer theory affect phenomenology popular culture and advertising, and I cannot speak. So I hand over to you, Alcom. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and also um, for all of you that are tuning in today. So I hope that everything is visible and fingers crossed that my videos work. So uh, like uh, Elke so kindly pointed out, my talk today is titled A Seat at the Table, Food Television and the Changing Definition of Food Literacy and Culinary Capital. And here I'll be focusing more on the building of culinary capital through mediated foodie discourse and how that then pulls in from ideas of food literacy into the space uh, in which culinary capital is produced and disseminated. Uh, so first off, I want to talk briefly about or situate uh, food television briefly as a medium of distinction. Uh, and this is mainly due to the uh, emergence of food television as a genre to educate people. And this is something that Isabelle de Solier uh, mentions when she talks about uh, the emergence of food television in Australia. Uh, so education first starts from the instructional uh, style cooking show of uh, technique, culinary knowledge, kitchen know-how, uh, aiming primarily to the primetime demographic of female uh, viewership, uh, and then slowly switching this education to ingredient, to the different ways of cooking, introducing multiculturalism and the idea of the urban foodie as a space where you can um, sort of you have access to multiple kinds of cooking or spicing up the kitchen. Um, and so this sort of leads away from education and into distinction in that it starts to pull in from all of these different cultural uh, ideas. And so this distinction that comes from the changing definitions or the changing contents of food television is defined or positioned by scholars 
Peter, Peter Nacarato and Kathleen Lovesco uh, within the Sport US concept of culinary capital. And here, culinary capital is basically drawing from all of these ideas of a cultural capital in which knowledge is produced, social capital in terms of where you eat and you know where you shop, um, and of course, economic capital in terms of actual physical and uh, economic access to this uh, kind of eating and food and cooking style. Television within this broader idea of culinary capital provides an aspir aspirational space in which um, the promise of viewership and vicarious consumption enables you to claim or enables you this false sense of claim at this culinary capital, right? So in a way, it allows you to bypass the more literal practices that one must partake in in order to have culinary capital, but the viewership itself alone is a step towards having this culinary uh, capital. And of course, this culinary capital is one, like I said, steeped in uh, this idea of having a capital is also based in steeped in hegemonic ideologies. So in a way, the mediated foodie culture is informed uh, by the stratifications of um, its society. And here, thus, the culinary capital is one that caters to the sentiments of the affluent, a Western, white, able, and of course, masculine um, identities. So this is kind of the um, broad uh, values of lifestyle TV as um, relating to food television. Um, so within this distinction and within this culinary capital, there is also a particularly peculiar strand of food television, which is credited to Anthony Bourdain, uh, which ranges in its debates from food and travel to um, political food television, right? So in a way, it moves away from the en purely entertainment style and purely kitchen knowledge, culinary knowledge style to including gastro diplomacy within the space of culinary capital. And thus it foregrounds sociocultural and political debates and somehow incorporates them into the building of a foodie identity. Uh, so like I said, this starts uh, and becomes popular with Anthony Bourdain. Um, he has famously stated on multiple occasions that there is nothing more political than food. And here you see a quote that elaborates on that. Um, who eats, who doesn't? Why do people cook what they cook? It is always the end or a part of a long story and often a painful one. Right. So here he moves away from the food itself, but more towards the inner workings, the cultural and social workings behind the scenes. And this is something that emulates a lot in political food television, where the food is the stepping point to uncover broader cultural politics um, of, of a given geographical space or given a community. And so after Bourdain's success with shows like Parts Unknown or No Reservations, there have been a growing number of food television programs or political uh, food shows that have been reflecting on and expanding these changing paradigms. So we see characters like uh, or hosts uh, and personas like Samin Nosrat and Steven Satterfield on Netflix. We see David Chang and Padma Lakshmi on um, Hulu, and we see Mark Marcus Samuelson and Roy Choi on PBS, and all of them have shows that more or less deal with representation, inclusivity, importance of the, my, uh, of the foodways of immigrants, but also of the oppressed and marginalized communities within um, the US, but also uh, related to larger, um, you know, migrational patterns and diaspora. Uh, and uh, they also, to a certain extent, address the problems and the systemic oppressions caused by the food industry and the food systems that are um, bait, that are set in the US. And also social justice, of course, is related to that. And so these shows uh, shift the definition or start to add a new layer of um, definition to the idea of culinary capital as being you should eat this food or you should buy this kind of food, um, but instead find or redefine culinary capital 
by foregrounding the obscured foodways and food systems as opposed to good food and digestible stories, right? So the idea of knowing whose food you're eating, knowing what kind of, of story it belongs to is part of this um, is part of this culinary capital. And of course, these shows also react to particular political discourses in the US, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about this when I give a specific example. Um, and of course, these shows um, demand reparations to the people whose foodways have been obscured and who have been systematically oppressed. Um, and they exercise to a certain extent those reparations by allowing or giving a platform. And here there's a question because that part uh, will be a part of my uh, concluding thoughts as to the extent in which this is actually realized on these shows, but it's definitely a thought that comes up multiple times um, within this corpus of new uh, political food television. Um, so hopefully uh, my video will work and I want to show you the trailer for Broken Bread with Roy Choi, and this is a PBS and taste uh, K-Set and Tastemade co-production. And it is a show that very much builds on this idea of trying to find common grounds and trying to understand or having different communities understand each other's uh, political, social, economic stance through the uh, metaphor of breaking bread. And um, let me know if there's something wrong with the technical stuff. I'm a street cook, man. Even before I was a street cook, I was a street person. I'm out there doing things, whether it's approved or not approved. Because my whole existence in this world is to nourish and to feed people. I'm just challenging conventional thought that a business can thrive in other ways than money. Here's a business. Here's a purpose. Heart disease rates, the diabetes rates, the obesity rates, the cancer rates, they're all exponential. There's no way to be confused about why these things are happening when you look at what food is available. How do you create a community that believes that everybody belongs and is willing to infuse hope for whom hope is for? You're presented sometimes with that moment where you have to rise. Thousands of people on the street, starving. How are you going to feed them? history of food in this community is also to talk about social justice. Whether your beliefs differ from mine, you know, we're breaking bread. And we're talking and I'm disagreeing with you. You're disagreeing with me. And then from there, we can start to talk about these things and maybe understand each other. Maybe I can be a voice for the people that a lot of times don't get a voice. Right, so hopefully um, you were able to follow that brief trailer. And so Broken Bread, um, does or works on this premise of breaking bread where the uh, titular host uh, Roy Choi goes and um, explores or eats with different people from different communities and shows the different perspectives right different social stances political realities uh, social justice or injustice issues in different uh, communities and he does this in his native LA so the whole show is based set in LA and it explores a variety of topics from incarceration and rehabilitation uh, to the um, to the legalization of cannabis and the kind of social injustice that came with it, especially for the black demographic and also the very last episode of the first season that dealt with Watts, um, the famous LA neighborhood known for its high criminality rates and low income and going into this a community that has been from the outside gated off and from the inside this distrust formed right so it's a quite the impenetrable uh, space and he goes into this space and he tries to understand the different kinds of systemic uh, injustices that are at play that developed or that maintain this idea of um, a very closed off space that is potentially dangerous uh, not only within itself but also to the broader um, sort of a texture or broader framework of LA. And going into Watts, what Choi discovers is the existence, or at least what he brings to the forefront, because I don't think he discovers it, but he brings to the forefront uh, the systemic oppression that maintains the space. And the show emulates this by showing 
um, the police intervention on a block party. So this moment of very soft uh, pan shots, a lot of people eating, drinking, ambient music, a laughter is suddenly cut with the, you know, with the arrival of police cars and sirens, um, a lot of um, unwarranted uh, searches happening, people being moved around, people being told they can't stand on the street, they have asking for all sorts of licenses for this party to take place. And that moment allows uh, the viewers to be confronted with the systemic oppression that they are perhaps unaware of or you know that is often not found in these shows so abruptly right they're often alluded to but they're never shown um in a way in the way that it is shown in this particular episode and the camera movement also in turn reflects this from the soft um panning shots like i said it moves to shaky cam and more of a journalistic style of uh, depicting this and it oftentimes focuses on the same people who it showed in a very light mood, happy mood, to a very frustrated and upset uh, mood due to this being a systemic um, form of oppression that they're not, that they're quite used to. And on the other hand, the show also shows alternatives to the systems at play, right? So it's not only all of these oppressions, but also people who stand up against it. And also the particular kinds of people to whom these alternatives uh, cater to, right? So a lot of undocumented people who have um, who don't have access to food, how do you feed them because you can't have um, establishments? So this is explored quite a bit and it shows alternative ways of feeding people that would not endanger undocumented people to go there and take this food, right? Because it's harder to map. So a lot of moving structures, pop-ups, are explored as ways to feed people. So in a way, what the trailer doesn't really address, but the show does quite a bit, is speak about food systems at play and the how it oppresses marginalized communities, but also how marginalized communities can work out alternatives to the system that still work, that fail, but at least do something to counteract that. Um, so the second show that I have is a Taste the Nation, and Taste the Nation has a very straightforward um, political premise of championing or foregrounding immigrant foodways within the US. And I have a very short trailer from that as well. This is my first rodent. What does it taste like to you? It's like chicken. <laughs> Everything that the American cuisine is today is because all these different people and different cultures contributed to it. Mmm, 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 oh my God. It's such a flavor explosion. Everybody knows Thai food. Nobody knows about Thai people. There's the dish and then there's the hands that prepare and serve the dish. You are cook good, baby. <laughs> This alone is reason to come to El Paso. <laughs> mm. um, that's good, huh? <laughs> Burp a little. <laughs> the Thai 2.0, dude. Have no time. Watch your back. God damn it. <laughs> Food is medicine. We've all heard that before. It's much deeper than just what feeds you. It's like a spiritual connection. The gateway to another culture often happens first food. Okay, inshallah. inshallah. If you sit at my table and eat with me, you'll know who I am. This is what American food looks like. This is the original. This is real America. I'm really sorry you can't eat this. I always do that. So with this one, um, there is a much more pronounced political premise and the show is a part of this wave of television programming that came in post uh, Trump candidacy and subsequent presidency discourse uh, that filled with anti-immigration policies especially towards immigrants of color um, and of course the Mexican border and so this show was uh, what Padma Lakshmi in an interview says 
what a rebuttal to the fear mongering from Washington, right? To show that immigrants do not pollute or contaminate an existing America, but in fact make up this America. And while the show does address a lot of the systemic issues and histories of oppression, similar to Broken Bread, it also creates the space of America and it situates immigrants within America as a way of justifying their existence, of justifying their food ways, right? So they're always depicted or talked about in relation to what they've contributed to America. And in that sense, one of the most problematic episodes of this show becomes the show, uh, the episode titled The Original Americans, where the um, indigenous people of the land are considered to be original Americans, which is, of course, a pro very problematic discourse as they are a group of people who have been, you know, who've had tremendous amount of violence inflicted upon them by these so-called Americans, right? So the show, in a way, while a lot more political in its stance and a lot more direct with the kind of discourse that it tries to emulate, it also falls flat in terms of its depiction of the nuances of these groups and tries or and then has a bit of a problem, I would say, in terms of assimilative discourse and recognition of these food ways as they stand on their own. So this idea of all of these groups belonging equally and making up American food is quite problematic, especially because there's an episode that talks about Oscar Mayer and this commercial kind of uh, prepackaged food and then original Americans, right, who have been stripped from their land. And to say that all of this together makes up America uh, creates this uh, false sense of equality and equity in terms of uh, the contribution that they have to uh, the land and also their connection to America as um, a sort of imperial space. Two so minutes. to wrap things up, yes, <laughs> to wrap things up, um, I want to go back to this question that Sokmani Korhana posed in her 2020 article, can producers and consumers of food decolonize foodie culture, uh, to can, of color decolonize foodie culture? And here she sets up three parameters in her idea of allyship and one of them being centering other perspectives and practices the second one being extending to men engaging in domestic realms so not just colonial exploring but bringing it back into the domestic space and third performing the labor of solidarity such that it leads to shifts in dominant settler paradigms right so not only doing these um, these labors but also making sure that they upend some of the prominent hegemonic discourses. And in that sense, um, these shows do go beyond the promise and premise that cater to the foodie that we see in the early iterations of political TV shows, or some of them uh, maybe still emulate that, but we see a progress in that sense. And in that sense, they also do expository work beyond depiction, right? So as opposed to someone like Andrew Zimmern, we see a lot of more expository work into the history, the difficulties, and the sort of historical um, obstructions or oppressions that have somehow found their way to contemporary um, times. And we see that a lot more with a Broken Bread than perhaps Taste the Nation. Um, and they do confront obscured issues and they do address complacency in some more than others, uh, but this is also an important step to identify or to point fingers to this aspirational uh, culinary capital to create a space of self-reflexivity and not just give new information that will build on this cultural capital. Uh, so in that sense, uh, these shows do shift, do show this shift to a different kind of culinary capital, one that tries to foreground cultural politics. Um, I think that's it on my part. Thank you for listening. Fabulous, thank you very much. And um, can we show our appreciation, please? Thank you. Um, our final speaker in this panel is Zoe Shacklock from the University of St Andrews. She will be talking about uh, where broken treasures are brought back to life the Repair Shop and Television's Ideology of Ability. Um, the Repair Shop, for those of you who are not British, is um, a small-scale 
program that has um, has achieved enormous success um, and and um, quite quite a surprise, I think, to the program makers themselves. Um, so it's, it would be very interesting to hear a more critical narrative today. Um, so Zoe is a lecturer in film and um, film studies at the University of St Andrews. Her research focuses on the body in contemporary television with particular interest in movement, queerness and empathy. Her monograph, Television and the Moving Body, is under contract with Edinburgh University Press. And I hand over to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so the work that I'm presenting today is taken from the upcoming book that Elke just mentioned from a chapter that I am currently writing right now. Um, so this is very much a work in progress. Uh, so all and any comments and feedback are very welcome. OK, so in popular reviews, the repair shop is often described as being particularly heartwarming and moving. Uh, in The Guardian, Rebecca Nicholson suggests that there is uh, not a more lovely show on television. It is so good natured and pure, so wholesome and nice that at times it seems too good for this cold and cynical world. In The Telegraph, Anita Singh describes it as a kind of comfort blanket, reassuring us that everything will be all right, everything can be fixed and nothing is too far gone. And in the Radio Times, David Butcher suggests that the whole production radiates care and skill and warmth, like an enchanted hot water bottle of loveliness. So for so many viewers, there seems to be something about the show that provides this real sense of comfort and care, something about it that might be as restorative as the act of repair itself. Okay, so if you're not uh, familiar with the repair shop, in each episode crafts people with various specialties. So it includes things like leather work, carpentry, ceramics, art conservation, silversmithing, metalwork, and even teddy bear repair. Um, they restore the broken, broken and aging heirlooms uh, brought into to them by members of the public. Each cherished item comes with a history and a story which the owners tell to the craftspeople and also directly to the audience through director camera address. After being repaired, the object is then returned to the owners, usually to some kind of heightened emotional response. So the repair shop first aired on BBC Two in 2017, and then it moved to BBC One in 2019, and then it uh, gained a primetime evening slot in 2020, just before the very first lockdown. Um, a lot of people, myself included, found the repair shop over that first lockdown in sort of March to May. And many of its qualities that the reviewers single out, so things like comfort and care and intimacy, qualities that of course have always been key to television but were particularly important and discussed du uh, during lockdown. Um, so today uh, as Elka suggested I do want to take a slightly more critical approach to this show and think a little bit about how these qualities are mobilized in the repair shop and to complicate them a little bit. Um, quite similar to Abigail's paper earlier again just to think about sort of questioning perhaps some of the feel-good dynamics of this program to think about sort of what's going on underneath. So craft is of course in essence the act of making, so creating something new from starting materials, whether it's an item of clothing or a table or even a meal. This means that craft is often seen as possessing some kind of radical creative power, so it's often seen as possessing the ability to create new communities or identities or a new kind of society. And these ideas are most often expressed in terms of either anti-capitalist critique or in terms of gender. So um, celebrating traditionally disparaged forms of women's work such as knitting and sewing. And most of the scholarship of, about craft on television focuses on either of those two elements. Um, unlike other craft programs, though, of course, the repair shop is a program concerned with the repair and refashioning of existing objects rather than the construction of something new from scratch. And as such, it might be unsurprising that the program is more concerned with refashioning existing ideologies of identity rather than creating something new. And this works specifically in relation to age, health and ability. So each episode of the repair shop begins with a narration um, by Bill Patterson, who welcomes viewers to the repair shop where broken treasures are brought back to life. Immediately from the very beginning, then, um, this suggests that the program is about restoration and reanimation, 
about mending the broken and fixing the worn. And in doing so, it sets up a world in which to be old, worn, and not functioning optimally is a problem that needs to be fixed. So in this way, the repair shop echoes what we call the medical model of disability, which also sees the old, worn, stilted human body as a problem to be resolved. This is in opposition to the social model of disability, which defines disability as something created by society in terms of barriers um, and things that can't be navigated. Um, so just as an example, the medical model would suggest that paraplegia creates disability, whereas the social model would argue that it's the lack of ramps and the prevalence of stairs that creates disability. The medical model argues that disability requires intervention, and the social model suggests that it needs social and environmental change. Um, Rosemary Garland Thompson identifies five key narratives of disability, three of which evoke the medical model. So understanding it as a flaw that needs to be normalized, as a defect that has to be compensated for, and as something that has to be avoided at all costs. So these narratives paint illness, impairment, and age as something that demands a fix, something that requires intervention to be restored to some kind of normative functioning. Together, these narratives construct what Tobin Sievers refers to as the ideology of ability, which at its most general is just the preference for able-bodiedness. As Sievers argues, this ideology takes many different shapes and forms, and it's deeply embedded in much of our thinking and many of our practices. Um, but one of its sort of most predominant features is the way in which it obscures the overwhelming reality of sickness, injury, disfigurement, enfeeblement, old age, and death, instead celebrating health and youth. This sharp contrast that uh, the ideology of ability sets up between being whole and healthy and between being worn and old and broken is central to the repair shop and to those feel-good, comforting, affective dynamics. So uh, as I said earlier, each episode of the repair shop involves, involves owners bringing in treasured objects and they explain the importance of the object and its history. But it's striking that so many of the owners are themselves suffering from illness or otherwise um, just showing the wear and tear of old age. Again and again throughout the program, people confess their own illnesses or their own inevitable aging, seeing the repair of their treasured, treasured object as a way of returning to happier times or ensuring some kind of le um, personal legacy after death. Just to go back to Garland Thompson, her remaining two dominant narratives of disability describe how the disability becomes a site for sentiment, either pity or a source of inspiration and courage. And the repair shop similarly exploit, uh, exploits disability for sentimental purposes, relying on the contrast between the body of the owner and that of the object for its emotional impact, both presented as existing in various states of disrepair, but only one of which can be fixed. So I'm going to look at two stories from the 2021 Christmas special of the repair shop, which really epitomize this ideology of ability at work. Um, I'm not going to show clips because I've had enough experience with teams to not show clips, um, but I will talk you through them. And if you're in the UK, you can still watch the episode on iPlayer, or of course it is on Box of Broadcasts. Uh, if you're outside the UK, you can watch a little bit of the first story that I'm about to discuss on YouTube, and I'll drop a link in the chat um, afterwards. Okay, so at the beginning of the episode, Maureen Donaghy here brings in her childhood doll, Susie, explaining how what she calls her walking doll was a gift when she was ill with polio as a child. She describes how her parents would move Susie's arms and legs to model walking and how she herself would mimic this in order to learn how to walk again. While she did recover from polio and was able to regain her strength, she now suffers from um, post-polio syndrome and is experiencing widespread muscle deterioration across her body. She explains that although she thinks that the walking mechanism inside the doll is probably too old to be fixed, she would like the doll's um, appearance restored and just to make her look a little bit better. Um, as she says, I can't be repaired this time, but she can, I hope. So here the show sets up a really clear dichotomy between the human body that breaks down and deteriorates and the promise of repair and restoration located in the object. 
By linking this specifically to Donaghy's individual and highly personal story, it also reiterates one of the other key tenets of the ideology of ability. As Sievers describes it, the belief that disability is always individual, a property of one body, not a feature common to all human beings. The dichotomy here between deterioration and restoration is emphasized further in the moment when the doll is returned to Donaghy. So when it's presented, uh, Julie Tatchell, who's one of the two self-described teddy bear ladies uh, who did repair the doll, asks if she would like to see her walk. And Donaghy replies, can she, um, in a trembling voice. We then see a close-up of Susie's feet walking as Donaghy moves her along the tabletop, and then a shot of Donaghy's face as she is overcome with emotion. So this moment is clearly meant to tug on our heartstrings. Um, I will admit on Christmas Eve, I lost it and completely bawled on my couch crying over a doll on Christmas Eve. Um, so it's very clearly um, using this for emo emotional impact, but it relies entirely again on the contrast between the repaired doll and the irreparable body of Donaghy herself. And the doll's restored movement is contrasted with the fact that Donaghy can no longer walk in such a fashion. The scene begins with a shot of Donaghy slowly entering the barn, leaning on her walker. So this moment in which the freshly repaired object is returned to the owner is a key feature of each episode. And I think we can read the moments as makeover scenes and in so doing situate the repair shop within the broader range of reality and lifestyle programs interested in these moments of transformation or what Rachel Mosley calls the makeover takeover of British television. Makeover scenes are, of course, key sites through which ideology circulates, most notably in terms of policing uh, normative standards of gender and beauty, which, of course, also um, tie into questions of ability and race as well. In the scene that we just looked at, the focus of the makeover lies not in the restoration of the doll's appearance, but her ability to walk. And this is emphasized by the fact that um, Donaghy does uh, tell us that she doesn't think that the mechanism can be repaired. So it's even more of a surprise when the doll can walk again. The power of the makeover thus hinges on a contrast between normative and non-normative mobility. If cosmetic makeover scenes present a body that conforms to normative standards of gender and beauty, then the mended makeover scene seems to present an object that conforms to the ideology of ability, in which movement must be made smooth and wear and tear is to be hidden. An identical narrative appears later in the very same episode. Um, so Nilesh and Vishal Palmer here bring in an, an old train set that belonged to Nilesh and his cousin Deepak, who's Vishal's father, as children. The train set was a Christmas gift and it hasn't worked since the 1970s. They explain that Deepak has motor neuron disease and can no longer move his arms and legs, instead uh, and only communicating through his eyes. So again, here we can see how the episode is setting up a contrast between a body whose normative movement has deteriorated and an object that might hold the promise of restoration and uses that to generate the emotion. Uh, Deepak is too unwell to attend the barn himself, so only Nilesh and Vishal are present to receive the restored train. Uh, Vishal states that his dad will get truly emotional watching this go round as we see the train kind of going round the tracks. After Nilesh and Vishal leave the barn, however, there is a short sequence uh, of Deepak in the hospital using a computer to express his thanks to the repair shop team with the train set up beside him on a table. So this is um, an unusual scene. It's quite rare for the repair shop to show the object or the owners outside of the space of the barn. We never kind of follow them home to see what happens afterwards. Denied that moment of contrast between the repaired object and the disabled body, the repair shop seems to go to great lengths to be able to achieve it. Um, in Mosley's work on the makeover, she argues that the revelation moment often involves close-ups of faces, inviting us to search for genuine, unperformed emotion on the faces of ordinary people. But the scenes here with Deepak shy away from such a close-up, instead using longer shots to further emphasize the contrast between Deepak's lack of normative mobility and the train's restored motion. So this is the ideology of ability at work, the creation of a strict binary between the working and the impaired, and the celebration of the fantasy of restoration to youth and health. 
In both of the examples I've discussed, the objects are presented as a way for their owners to experience some kind of sense of proxy repair. For Donaghy, as I quoted earlier, she can't be repaired, but the doll can. For Deepak, his son Vishal repeatedly says that the train will take him back to his youth, bring him back to happier times. And again, this reiterates the ideology of ability, suggesting that to be in disrepair is a state from which we must desire to return. And again, it also presents any question of disability as solely an individual problem by placing emphasis on the personal stories behind the objects. So again, what the show is doing is suggesting that age and disability are individual issues that require individual intervention. And I think the fact that this narrative is repeated twice in one episode, particularly a Christmas episode, which is already aiming to be particularly emotionally resonant and heartwarming, emphasizes how much the program relies upon the ideology of ability for its meaning and emotional impact. So just for the remainder of this paper, I'm just going to return to think a little bit more about some of those feelings of intimacy and care that the reviewers um, that I talked about at the beginning identified to think about how this is communicated to the audience and how else it might play into the ideology of ability. I just mentioned Rachel Mosley and the close-up in makeover scenes and how the repair shop might not be using close-ups in, um, in these makeover moments. Um, but the close-up is more commonly used throughout the program to illustrate the process of repair itself. So in each episode, we see lots and lots of close-ups of the crafters at work, of their fingers, um, you know, putting things back together, and they draw attention to the actions involved in making and mending. So the very kind of precise, small, detailed, careful actions of craftspeople. I'm just going to use the work here of Alexia Smith to think a little bit about what these close-ups are doing and again, how they might be mobilized into the ideology of ability. Uh, she coins the term teleaffectivity to describe the use of the close-up on television, suggesting that it attests to the fact that television is designed for intimacy and a particular kind of close affective engagement that suits the context in which it's viewed, at home, in the family, intimate, et cetera. Um, Smith focuses exclusively on medical and science fiction horror programs that are concerned with close-ups of the inside of the body, but I think that her work has broader relevance, and I do want to apply it to these craft programs, because um, I do also think that the repair shop's use of close-ups, again, um, act as another site in which sort of the teleaffectivity, um, in which feelings of intimacy are generated. So we're just going to look at another example from an episode that aired in January. Um, Wendy Bray brings in her late mother's writing case and she explains that she is suffering from stage four cancer and she has limited time left and she wants the case to be repaired so she can pass it down to her daughter and her granddaughter. So again, here we've got the show immediately setting up this contrast between the irreparable human body and the fantasy of repair in the objects that they bring in. Uh, leather worker Susie Fletcher begins, begins to work on the case, stating that repairing an object of someone with a terminal illness gives her a huge sense of responsibility, and so she needs to go very, very cautiously. And we see multiple extreme close-ups of her fingers at work as she repairs the writing case. The use of the extreme close-up here emphasizes the care that Fletcher takes, so not just the physical care of precise small movements, but the emotional care with the precious family heirloom as well. And this is communicated to us through the intimacy and the teleaffectivity of the close-up. It also emphasizes that these are the movements of a skilled worker, something that not just anyone can do. So they're so precise, so careful, so detailed, such fine motor control that we have to see them in extreme close-up. Um, Fletcher herself, as she's repairing the object, notes that she's lucky to have the skill to be able to fulfill people's dreams. So the close-up does emphasize and create a sense of craft and repair as care. Um, but in making the sense of care inseparable from the skill and ability of the craftspeople, it again reiterates the ideology of ability. So celebrating particular kinds of movements, ones that require really fine motor control, presenting it as powerful enough to grant wishes. So what we're seeing here is the extreme close-ups which generate this feeling of care and intimacy are again operating in tandem with the ideology of ability. 
So um, to conclude, I do want to note, you know, that the repair shop's focus on intimacy and care is very powerful. And there is something that the program can teach us about TV and care. Um, and it is also a very useful antidote, as the show says, to throw away culture. And there is a really kind of interesting um, environmental or eco-critical uh, analysis of this program as well. But what I hope I've demonstrated is that it is important to sort of interrogate how these particular qualities are um, fostered, in this case, be precisely because it's using the ideology of ability as its engine. And there might be other places across TV and other key televisual and features uh, and feelings where we might be able to find the ideology of ability at work, structuring ideas of what counts as the right kind of movement or action or functioning on television more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, and thank you to all three speakers for keeping so beautifully on time. Um, can I maybe ask us all to um, switch our cameras back on so that we can see each other? That'd be great. Um, and we have about 20 minutes for questions um, for these three excellent papers, as always. Really interesting. I find it really fascinating that you all kind of pointed out, um, you know, there's something really positive about these changes in the programs. And at the same time, there's more work that needs to be done. Um, so yeah, really, really fascinating um, how much that is. How much do you think is that connected to the genre of reality slash um, lifestyle television directly? So, so it, it struck me that Abigail, for example, was, you know, kind of indicating actually the underlying problem is that of the narrative itself. It is about transformation and because transformation is towards the better, um, it always, you know, has to return to um, a kind of value that is so embedded in our society that is actually, you know, heteronormative and, he and, and hegemonic. So um, definitely ableist, definitely, um, you know, directed towards a particular kind of culture, etc. So yeah, I, I wonder if you want to comment on that at all. Um, I'll, I'll briefly comment on that. Um, I certainly think that the issues we've all raised are not only present in reality television, but I think it provides such a powerful, I, I suppose, yeah, point of reference for what that looks like, especially because of the history of, you know, yeah, TV as pedagogy, reality television is doing that much more explicitly than other forms. And so I think it probably comes out in ways that are, uh, yeah, a little more on the sleeve. <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? Um, a little more evident there. And also perhaps, yeah, with, with a stronger view toward changing the viewers' perceptions in life as well. I think it's, you know, there's kind of the intimation in, um, you know, so thinking about Fat Representation, a show that came out recently on Hulu that just stopped its run was a show called Shrill. Um, which is a very kind of cutesy pastel show about, um, you know, self-identifying as fat and the the power that can have. And there are very similar elements in that show to some of the elements that I mentioned about these reality shows. But the difference is that um, there you're watching a character who you might genuinely disagree with. And here I think we're really being brought in to the fold. We're all supposed to agree on the kind of politics of the show. And so I think, yeah, with that, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, that agenda is more, it is stronger in reality television. I think there's also a way in which, and I was thinking about this during Abigail's paper as well, when these programs are part of a genre and they're so narratively concerned with improving, whether it's self-improvement or fixing things or et cetera, like we want to believe them when they say that they're improving the genre themselves that you know that they're more kinder or caring than the previous iterations. And I think it's very easy to buy into that. 
And I think what all of our papers were trying to do is sort of resist that a little bit in some way. Yeah, I, I definitely resonated with Zoe said, you know, sitting there crying on the couch while watching it. The amount of times in which especially not so much Biggest Loser, which I think is a little more. Uh, yeah, the politics of that are a little different. It's a little harder to buy into the story, especially after 20 seasons. But um, Queer Eye still gets me in, you know, new episodes, despite the fact that I, yeah, I feel pretty strongly about it. Uh, yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? I could ask a question. Um, uh, Alcum, I thought your presentation was so interesting and I haven't really thought about food studies as much myself as I have about, you know, fat studies by way of dieting and things like that. Um, so I guess maybe this is a question coming from my, <laughs> from my own interest, but um, yeah, do you think like, do you feel that, and you sort of did touch on this, but I guess I'd be interested to hear you kind of reiterate and talk about it a little bit. Do, yeah, do you think that there is potential in this medium to like sort of push forward further into that political sphere? Or do you think that it's just like, like, yeah, is there room for these conversations about food to sort of have whatever you would define as an impact? Or is it just kind of, yeah, or is it hopeless? <laughs> I mean, I, li I like to stay positive. I think just in general, uh, more of a disposition, but there's definitely... Um, there is potential, but there's also pitfalls like you guys also talked about the, you know, transformation needs to happen towards something. And in the space of food television, the audience or like the reference point is always white, male, affluent. So whatever show is produced is produced for them, be it on Netflix, on Hulu, it may center other perspectives. But the demographic is also always someone who can afford to pay ten dollars a month for a subscription. And so that in that sense, you know, I often question the limits to which this political, you know, calling someone out can go. But on the other sense, like there is an like it's a quite interesting episode or quite interesting comparison. There is an interview in High on the Hog uh, in the second episode. And they interview the same person as someone as Anthony Bourdain does. So Glenn Roberts, the person who brings out California gold rice back from oblivion. And while in Anthony Bourdain's case, the two of them sit comfortably and share, you know, a glass of wine and talk about how, you know, black people have escaped to the north and abandoned their southern roots, as opposed to Stephen Satterfield, who actually says, what are the reparations you're doing? This is this is a product of slave labor. How do you how comfortable do you feel as a white man profiting from this? So, you know, of course, he doesn't say you have no business doing this, but at least, you know, he does imply that through the kind of questions that he poses. And then in one, they're sitting in a restaurant space and the other one, they're standing. So, you know, it adds a level of tension to that scene. Um, so I think there is some sort of movement towards that but yeah like it's hard to not also be skeptic because of the people who these shows are produced for it's still produced by netflix you know it's still the stakeholders are still the same kind of people who benefit so i think that would be my answer great thank you um Bethan has a question uh, the repair shop has been featured on children in need previously but it was also on red nose day this year i think did you see any of this, Zoe, and what were your thoughts on how the show was positioned on each one? It's a really good question. So what happened yeah, thanks, when Beth. the program moved into comedy in a way? Um, I admit I have not seen either of those specials, <laughs> which means that maybe this is going to be a short um, answer. But I suspect certainly if it's on children, well, both of them are still... There's just something interesting, I think, about how quick the show wants to move into these, you know, healing people, moving into these spaces in which there are sick people and exploiting that um, 
for its, you know, again, just for its narrative and emotional engine as well. Um, is there something, I mean, having not seen the particular episodes, is there something particular in them that you're thinking of, Bethan? Sorry, I have a cat who's, who's been oh, pest. <laughs> never apologise for a cat. <laughs> Yeah, he's. I've got my lunch left over on my desk, and he's trying to eat it. So, which is why he's being the best. Um, yeah, no, it, it was really interesting because I caught the Red Nose Day one this year, and um, I think it was Dawn French and Judy Dench uh, were on it, and that was like very much kind of pitched as like a comedy. Whereas on Children in Need, they they took on like this little boy on there with a teddy bear that was like really important, um, and I just found it really interesting how. The Red Nose Day one was so like almost completely opposite to Children Need and like the larger discourse of the show, and I just, I kind of thought that was interesting and would have liked to if you'd seen it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'd I, I, seen I will that. have to have a look at it. I mean, it is like Elka mentioned. I think this is the success of this show has surprised everyone. Um, and it is at the point now where some of its um, hosts are sort of taking on like celebrity status, sort of similar to, you know, like the celebrity chefs that you talked about, Alcom, and sort of how that's functioning there. So I think it's interesting to see what it's doing in those spaces where it's sort of drawing perhaps from some of the other meanings of the program. Um, I will have to have a look at it to see what sort of happened to the sense of care in it and how that's sort of working when it's being used more for that kind of humour celebrity point. So I'm sorry I don't really have a very articulate no, answer to your good. question. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me as well is that um, all, of the, um, all of the shows that you mentioned um, have significantly more diverse ca um, you know, presenter cast than they used to have. Or you know, the, you know, in, in in the case of, of cooking television and the, the US shows, um, th that's really really noticeable as well. And then obviously the, the repair shop, um, the main presenter um, is is from a black uh, background. So do do you think that is that EDI? So so the attempt to to address the issues of the past, i.e you know, including more diverse cast? Or is this also why the shows are able to be a bit more caring? You know, if you think back to what Rowan was saying at the beginning of uh, in uh, in today's keynote, um, the, the question of care seems to emerge as, as a key topic in a way already. I mean, I can speak for like the food television part and absolutely, you know, the um, background of these hosts are more accentuated with each passing day. Like, you know, you know everything there is to know about Roy Choi. He starts like, you know, his trailer and all of the intros say I'm a street cook. Before that, I was a street person. And, you know, he talks a lot about his background as a Korean American um, or same with Padma Lakshmi. She in the uh, like introduction clip bit or like the opening sequence, she does say that she was an immigrant. She emigrated with her mother when she was four. So you get definitely that positioning of, you know, why I do what I do is from a personal stance. Like I am one of these people, even though, of course, uh, like Zoe said, they are now consecrated and they stand for something. They are, you know, celebrity chefs in their own right. So in that sense, you know, that discrepancy does exist, but it's brushed over with that, you know, over enunciation of their position as, you know, outsiders. And I think maybe, Abigail, it works in also these, you know, formerly fat, fat people who understand, but also, you know, have overcome this kind of, um, so that's it on the food television part. Yeah, absolutely that. And I, I think, um, you know, something like Queer Eye has, a, a, a real almost hyper focus on each of the like hosts identities and backgrounds in order to show you know well ostensibly to show where they're coming from and the reason why they're the best person to give that advice in that moment you know um I think I'm a little skeptical about the ways in which we're seeing social justice folded into these 
popular dialogues, though, as many of us are, because I, yeah, I worry about that broad brush that gets taken to difference as, you know, other and like sameness as, <laughs> you know, as the one. And, and I, I suppose, you know, when we see that with fat bodies, especially like with weight loss, um, the idea that there is this attainable thinness for people that at least gets you to a certain echelon, you know, or you're allowed in a certain space and that one you can earn. Um, so when that gets mixed up with these issues of things like race and gender, as it does in other episodes of Queer Eye or or other episodes of Biggest Loser, I think it becomes very complicated whether anything particularly positive is happening other than the sort of re-entrenching of those, you know, very hegemonic capitalist narratives, right? Yep. In terms of the repair shop, I think, um, I mean, part of its ethos is about wanting, as, as well as caring and repairing objects, it wants to care for and repair the act of craft itself. And it's very explicitly concerned with that. Um, and that feeds in on one angle, it can be quite a regressive kind of nostalgic look back at, you know, the good old days when everyone could make stuff themselves and it very much plays into that. And, you know, I think some of the ideology of ability comes into that as well. Um, on the other hand, of course, it does stand perhaps a little bit apart from some of the other craft shows on television when you have hobby crafts people who tend to be more uh, white and middle class because that's what you need to be to be able to do a lot of, you know, sewing or something and to have the money and the time to be able to devote yourself to that kind of activity. Whereas a lot of the pe uh, crafts people in the repair shop, because they've gone into trades, we have a broader like a range of class backgrounds and race as well. So I don't know, I don't know how they chose to cast it, but again, I just think it's an interesting, it's just another one of the little contradictions of the show in that at the same time, it is both regressive and nostalgic while also actually doing something quite positive in terms of showing alternative career paths and doing something, you know, to protect these particular kinds of, um, like these, yeah, trades and these uh, work pathways as well. So yeah, there's not sort of one kind of simple brushstroke. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Do we have any more questions? <clears throat> um, I have one for Abigail, sort of like going back because, you know, food studies and like this sort of um, diet and nutrition go quite hand in hand. I was wondering uh, what kind of discourse these shows have on the idea that capitalism or like this neoliberal uh, like structure is one of the main reasons for obesity, right? So how do they how do they deal with the idea that the problem they're trying to solve, like you know, in line with capitalism, is also caused by capitalism? So are, is there anything that alludes to that on the show? That's a really yeah interesting and compelling question. Um, for the most part, you know, you will get the odd reference to like um, you know you need to stop mostly it's okay i let me start over it's heavily classed in the way that they present these questions about like food and capitalism and personal responsibility so on the one hand um at the core of all of these instructions and across kind of reality television addressing fatness specifically is this idea that regardless of the situation that you're in your personal responsibility comes first right so you are personally responsible for becoming fat and you're personally responsible for undoing that as well because it's seen obviously as something you've done to yourself right um and folded into that discourse is very much the idea of like especially in the u.s the idea of if you choose to shop at a supermarket then you are playing into what we all know is bad, which is it's bad to shop at a supermarket and it's bad to eat bread and you shouldn't go to McDonald's and, you know, all of these things that obviously have quite distinct class dimensions. Um, for example, you know, the McDonald's example, I think is quite good because that's something that comes up frequently on a show like Biggest Loser. Um, Biggest Loser will also do, and and they did it again in the reboot series, which I was very surprised about given the the new tone, uh, they do a thing, so, you know, each week it's weigh-ins and the team that weighs the least wins that week. Um, in the older series, they would often have sort of punishments for the team that uh, that doesn't, you know, that loses, that weighs more. 
And those punishments are things like they have to eat donuts or they have to purchase all of their food from a food truck instead of going to the organic store where the other team gets to go. And the sort of idea of food as punishment is really built into this rhetoric. And I think it is, yeah, I I think there's sort of like, you know, yeah, those two things that sort of the, the issue of like, well, we know the system is a mess, but truly it's entirely up to you to navigate it. And surely there are no barriers too great to make it work for yourself, you know? I think. Yeah, that's interesting because that's literally like that's one of the main things that are now addressed in these shows, especially, you know, going to marginalized communities and addressing like food and accessibility and saying, hey, this is systemic. No one wants to feed their children, you know, candies instead of fruits. But if, if like if an apple is a dollar a piece and then, you know, a five pack of candy is the same, you're going to go for the five pack and eat it the whole week. So I, I was interested in how, you know, talking about the body addresses that but uh, you know obviously it is very classed yeah of course and and I suppose too like it's very moralized right so then we have those questions too about you know like what are you feeding your children and how are you feeding them and in what ways and those questions can get tied up really quickly in these moral dialogues about who's good and who's not good as a result of the food that they eat you know and Still within that very neoliberal kind of ethos, isn't it? Um, uh, why your ability? Great. Um, I think we've come to the end of the session. Um, can we thank the three speakers again for three really, really interesting papers, um, which I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to and I learned a lot from. It's really positive to see that there is something positive happening in reality TV and lifestyle television, but we need to be careful not to um, just simply celebrate those changes. So yeah, thank you very much. Our next session is on Wednesday um, at um, nine o'clock um, and it will, be, it will be about traditional television um, and online television um, and we have Swati Bhutti um, Katrin Bengata and Wilde Schanke Sundet talking to us. Um, so I will see hopefully quite a few of you on Wednesday. Until then, have a good time. Bye. <laughs>